Like, okay, class, this is your professor, Dr. Richard Severin. In this lecture, we're going to discuss pulmonary physiology. Um, the goal of this lecture will be to appreciate normal physiology, normal function of the respiratory system. Uh, and the reason we do this is because if you understand the basics of what things look like normally, it'll make things um, a little bit more simpler when we go through or appreciate or assessing someone with pathology. Uh, here's our objective. So again, just going over the basics of normal respiration, normal ventilation, um, and some of the basic fundamentals of oxygen and carbon dioxide transport. I would be remiss if I did not start off our lecture by talking about the whip and wasp and gas exchange gears. Again, this is probably my favorite model in human physiology, and, I th and it is because I think it um, quite aptly describes the dynamic interplay between the, let's get our little pen out, the circulatory cog, the ventilatory cog, and the peripheral muscle cog. The circulatory cog, of course, being the heart and lungs, and the ventilatory cog being our uh, respiratory system, our lungs, and the peripheral muscles. So this is, describes how you know, these systems are interdependent upon each other um, to produce human movement, which we can look at as a function of VO2 or oxygen consumed, as well as to expel metabolic waste, so to remove uh, the you know, carbon dioxide um, you know, from the blood. Um, you know, if we have changes in any of these systems, the other cogs have to work a little bit harder, and that explains why we see, you know, if we have patients with lung disease, for example, um, we often see changes in the circulatory cog. Quite often we see pulmonary artery changes and vice versa. People with heart failure end up having pulmonary complications due to backflow of fluid in the lungs. Um, it also describes how we can offset some of these things by improving extraction of the muscles. So we'll come back to this model later on, but again, if we understand how these systems work with uh, respect to each other, it really makes us, I think, better appreciate the symptoms and functional limitations that we might appreciate in a patient um, with disease. Now, just to give you some perspective um, on the lungs, so this is a classic video you've probably seen circulating on social media, um, but this is an example of a lung that was uh, dissected. So there is no, um, there isn't any pleura around it, but um, it'll still inflate. So this is a lung of someone who is a smoker, and then a lung of someone who is a a healthy individual right, that have been dissected. And you can see um, just, you know, again, this incredible reserve um, and the impacts of smoking um, can, can have on the lungs. Um, what I also think is kind of interesting, and you, get, you kind of get an appreciation, the lungs are, you know, we think, I, I believe, occasionally that lungs are these almost like balloon-like structures are kind of thin. They're, they're kind of sturdy, right? They're almost kind of bouncy if you've, if you've you know, dissected them out you'll appreciate they're kind of rubbery to a certain degree, and that's because of the lungs are 30% elastin by weight. Um, this elastin and elastic recoil will come into play later on when we start talking about ventilation, but again, just, you know, it's always important to appreciate the anatomy. The next slide I have here is of center court in Wimbledon. You might ask, like, what does tennis have to do with respiration? Well, the surface area of the lung, if we completely stretched out that tissue that we saw on that other slide, um, completely out. Um, the surface area to be at 750 feet, which is a size roughly of one tennis court, which indicates that our lungs have this incredible reserve, um, more reserve than we may ever even need, even at the extremes of exercise. Um, this shows that you know, your lungs very rarely fail you if you're healthy. Now, obviously, there can be some changes in patients with lung disease or smoking or different conditions, which we'll get into in later lectures, but just a reminder, your lungs have an amazing capacity for, for storing gas and exchanging gas. Uh, the next structure we'll get into are our pleura. So uh, we've got uh, two, two basic layers. So our visceral pleura, which is the internal serous membrane that attaches to the surface of each lung. Uh, this is almost analogous to the pia mater in the brain or the epicardium in the heart. Um, it's a serous layer that kind of uh, lines um, the, the outer surface of the lung. And then we have our parietal pleura, which um, was shown a bit, has this kind of very um, um, intimate connection to the chest wall. Um, the combination of these two layers that are separate from each other create the pleural space. It's a closed space, it's a potential space, um, you know, and they're independent from right to left side. This pleural space is really important because it creates a negative pressure environment the lungs sit in, which allow them to stay inflated. 
um, and by ch you know changing the volume in this chamber right or this pleural space it allows us to affect um, the volume of the lungs we'll get into that a little bit later um, contained within the pleural space is the pleural fluid uh, which is produced by the the parietal pleura and this uh, pleural fluid uh, basically helps lubricate the pleura, uh, the, the pleura, lubricate the lungs, and allows the lungs to slide and glide along the chest wall. Again, you, you breathe you know, between 12 to 20 breaths per minute, and you do that from the very first breath you take to the very last breath you take. Um, so we want to have that interface to be you know, as with little as friction as possible. Now, if air gets into the pleural space, a chest wound, a trauma, that would cause the lungs to collapse. It would violate and um, it would uh, puncture that... Um, negative pressure environment, um, um, you know, affecting the pressures contained in the pleural space, um, making it harder for the lungs to inflate it. So if we have air or fluid in there, we call that a pneumothorax, um, you know, or if we have blood in there, it could be a hemothorax or fluid ac accumulates, like which we can see often from, um, you know, infiltrates in the lung that can happen when someone has disease. Um, we call that a pleural effusion. So, you know, swelling or fluid entering into the pleural space. Um, just as an example of kind of what we're talking about here. So if we look at our little diagram, um, we've got our visceral pleura, again, which kind of lines the outer surface of the lung. Then we have our parietal pleura here. And that, you know, between them, we have this kind of the itty bitty or small pleural space. And that pleural space, again, is um, contained or filled with that um, uh, pleural fluid. Not a lot of it, it's only about 10 milliliters um, per space. Um, or per, per lung. And this negative pressure environment allows us to keep the lungs inflated by changing the volume in that pleural space, which, which happens with ventilation um, and breathing, um, that affects the, the pressure and the volume in the lungs and allows us to move air and in and out. And we'll get more into this, these pressure differences and kind of what happens in the lung as we move on, but just want to kind of touch on that here. So uh, the next kind of major landmark we'll talk about is the upper airway, or you may hear, refer this to as the upper respiratory tract. Uh, the goal of really the upper respiratory tract is to humidify, filter, and warm the air, or set it to the, an appropriate temperature. Um, this includes the nose, uh, the nasopharynx, the larynx, and the trachea proximal to the bifurcation, which occurs at the angle of Louis, which is roughly at the second rib. Rib, okay? Um, again, it's a first line filter. Our lungs really do prefer clean, warm, and humidified air, right? And so that's really the job of the upper airway is to provide that t quality of air to our lower respiratory tract, um, which we, you know, where, where our gas exchange will be occurring, okay? Uh, it also includes the epiglottis, which helps prevent food um, from flapping down into the airways. Um, and it also, it's where phonation occurs in our larynx, our laryngeal vocal cords. Um, this is actually qu why quite often, um, if you have a, you know, a upper respiratory tract infection, you have issues with talking because your vocal cords get um, inflamed. Basically, your vocal cords act like guitar strings or violin strings that vibrate um, in the presence of air, which is in your upper respiratory tract, and they produce sound. Um, and this is also why quite often patients who lack the ability to move air through their airways, like um, someone with lung disease, they may actually have issues with phonation because talking, again, is really just predicated on the movement of air through the upper airways with these cords that vibrate. Um, I also want to make a special point of emphasis that um, you know, the temperature of air that gets down to our lungs is pretty consistent. Um, you know, this, and it occurs in this upper respiratory tract. Um, you know, this is why if you're out in Chicago, where, where I'm currently at, where we're filming this video, um, we're able to breathe, you know, you know, you know without having our lungs freeze. Uh, now, obviously, there's a limit to it, but a lot of the mixing, um, you know, and, and warming um, or cooling occurs here. So we're able to kind of breathe in air pretty effectively. Um, even in areas where the temperature is not exactly ideal to our body temperature. Then we have our lower um, respiratory tract, okay, or lower airways, which again occur after that uh, bifurcation. Now, 
Um, you know, again, this occurs at the angle of Louis, which is at the second rib. And within the lower airways, we have two general um, branches, right? We have our conducting airways, where there's only, uh, we call ventilation. We'll get into the difference between that later on. And then our acinar airways, which are further down uh, the respiratory tract, um, it's where gas exchange occurs. So in the conducting airways, uh, there's a little bit more cartilage, more smooth muscle. Um, they're really there just to, to be the conduit, or you might remember that from our vascular physiology and anatomy, the conduit to bring um, that volume of air down into the, you know, the respiratory airways of acinar airways for gas exchange. Um, our acinar airways tend to be a little bit thinner. They have less cartilage, um, you know, and that's where our gas exchange occurs. And I'll, uh, fun little tip, um, once we get down to our uh, alveolar sacs, um, you know, each, each lung has about 480 million alveoli. And again, that's really just due to the amazing surface area. You can think of your alveoli almost as like grapes kind of on a, on a branch. They kind of, you know, fall up together. We have this amazing surface area. So again, our lungs very, very rarely fail you. Um, in terms of just remembering um, the difference between the two, uh, you know, your bronchia, your bronchioles, and your terminal bronchioles are, you know, your conducting airways. Transitional bronchioles are kind of a halfway point. And then our respiratory bronchioles, alveolar ducts, and alveolar sacs, uh, that's where gas exchange occurs. Uh, then, you know, getting down into, you know, anatomy, again, we've got, you know, our first division, our primary bronchii, which bifurcate um, at, again, at, at the at the angle of Louis in terms of surface anatomy. And just remembering as, you know, the, our, our bronchii enter the lung and they move further down that bronchial tree, which we have, you know, described here, as you can see, they get smaller and smaller and smaller and they contain less and less smooth muscle and less and less cartilage. Our large airways, again, um, are really designed to provide uh, the, the conduit for gas to get down to the lower airways. Um, they, it's where... You know, the airflow is typically at a higher velocity. It's a little bit more turbulent, um, a little bit more resistance. And then our smaller airways, and then the smaller they get, there's going to be a lower velocity, more laminar flow, and lower resistance. And again, they, they have a smaller radius. They have a huge cross-sectional area because of all the divisions that occur within uh, each little tree. Now, in terms of the lobes of the lung, um, you know, our left lung will have two lobes and our right lung has three lobes. Um, the left only has an upper and a lower and it only has a single oblique fissure. The right lung has three lobes, a lower, middle, and an upper, um, and that's created by this additional fissure, the horizontal fissure. And um, we'll show what that looks like in a little bit. Um, and there's some guides here for finding things from your surface anatomy. So um, looking at our lungs here, again, this is the right side, this is the left side, anatomical position. Um, so our right side, again, has uh, you know, that additional fissure, the horizontal fissure, which separates right upper lobe from the right middle lobe, and then our right lower lobe. Okay, And these fissures extend all the way to the back as well. And then we have our left lung, which only has a left upper lobe because there is no, there is no fissure here or horizontal fissure. So the left upper lobe and then a left lower lobe. We also have this little appendage called the lingula, which also you know, there's gas exchange there as well. Um, it's kind of in the same area as where the right lung, our right um, uh, middle lobe or the middle lobe would be located. Um, but it's not a separate or distinct uh, lobe. It's still a part of the left upper lobe, but um, when we auscultate it often on the patients, generally in the same area as the middle lobe, but just giving it a, a, an appreciation for what that looks like. Now, in terms of size, our, our lower lobes contain uh, almost a lot, a, a lot more surface area for gas exchange. Just giving an appreciation of what they look like on a chest radiograph. You can see here, again, just how large these lower lobes are um, that's, you know, a lot of where our reserve um, for, for gas exchanges occurring or exists. Um, now, getting down into some brass tacks here for, um, you know, each lung segment. Each lung segment, or each, sorry, each lung has 10 segments. Um, you know, the left sometimes, because, again, it doesn't have that middle lobe. 
Um, you know, we combined segments one and two and seven and eight. So we technically only had eight segments. But for the purpose of this class, um, you know, for auscultation, just to make it a little bit easier, because you always check the slide aside anyway, uh, the right middle lobe and the lingual lobe will be kind of auscultated as one separate distinct segment. Okay. Um, so, you know, each lung has 10 segments. We'll go over more of this uh, again later on once we start getting into um, chest examination. But again, it's remembering and appreciating the further we move down the um, respiratory tract and get to more and more divisions um, where the airways get smaller, less and less cartilage. And, you know, and I mean, there's 23 divisions. So starting from the trachea all the way down to the sac. And again, this gives you an appreciation of how much these, these airways split and divide to create that amazing uh, potential uh, for surface area. So um, one of the issues, again, with the lungs, we talked about how the lungs really prefer that the, um, you know, this moist environment, right? There's a lot of perfusions in the lungs, a lot of fluid in a certain sense. They're, they're, not, they're not dry, <laughs> per se, right? Um, so the, we want the alveoli, you know, cells lining them to be moist. So we have our uh, type 1 alveolar cells. That's where kind of gas exchange occurs. Um, and we want the, those layers to be moist. However, as you guys may recall, if you're ever at a bar, you have a pint of beer on a bar and it's, you know, you have a wet surface and it sticks to it, it's hard sometimes to remove it. That's surface tension, right? Created by the hydrogen bonds in, in water. Now, um, if that happens, you know, at a bar, we, you know, can do something to remove it, not a big problem. If it happens in our lungs, our alveoli are collapsed and we may not be able to reinflate them. That's a much bigger problem. So how do we accomplish um, reinflation, right? Because, you know, the alveoli are always supposed to be kind of moist. Um, well, we do this um, or accomplish that by a product called surfactant, which are secreted by type 2 alveolar cells. Uh, these are plump in size and, we'll, you know, they secrete this phospholipid uh, material once they're stretched, um, which happens when we take a deep breath in, um, and that secretes the surfactant to allow the lungs um, to stay inflated by breaking up the surface, uh, surface tension, right? Um, so they could also even help the alveoli reinflate even if they collapse. So it's the, the surfactant is really, really important. Unfortunately, um, you know, surfactant is, you know, it's not something you're just born with, um, you know, immediately in gestation. It takes about 28 weeks. This is why premature births um, were so fatal for so long because we didn't have, um, the kids didn't have surfactant. Fortunately, now with advances in medical science, we have uh, ways to address this with artificial surfactant that we can give to kids um, if they're premature. Uh, the next thing we'll talk about is, well, again, we mentioned our lungs prefer that warm, humidified, um, and clean air. Well, how do we keep our lungs clean? Well, the first step or first line of defense is our mucociliate escalator. Now, um, you guys you know, remember your goblet cells, which secrete mucus, the same kind of concept here. So our, you know, in our airways, mainly in our upper airways, we have these goblet cells, which secrete mucus that trap debris. Lining those airways are our uh, cilia, right? And the cilia beat and move that mucus, which contains that debris, to our carina, which is at the, tri the tracheal bifurcation, um, where this is where our cough reflex is stimulated. So once that debris gets to the carina, a cough is, is produced and expectorates or expels the debris out of the lungs. Um, and this mucocilia escalator um, helps keep the lungs clean. Um, these can be impaired potentially in patients um, who are on anesthesia or high amounts of opioids. Um, quite a lot, quite often we see patients with like, you know, congestion after they have a major surgery. But again, mucocilia escalator, um, again, we have our goblet cells, which secrete mucus, which you know, trap debris or particulate. They're mobilized up the airways to the carina, st stimulates the, the cough reflex to expectorate or cough or to expel debris out of the lungs. Well, uh, that's great. However, you know, probably don't want a mucocele escalator, probably don't want a lot of mucus down in the lower airways. Again, they're smaller. Um, we don't want a lot of stuff in the way when we're trying to exchange gases. So how do we keep the lower airway um, tract? clean because there, there may be some particles or maybe some debris that gets all the way down there um, and there is no escalator. Well, 
down there we are um, kind of we use macrophages, right, or macrophages to keep our lungs clean. Um, these specialized cells, you guys remember these from basic immunity. Um, you know, the translation is big eater, right? Our macrophages eat up and engulf foreign matter. They kill and digest bacteria. So it's our second line of defense to keep our lower airways tracks. So our, our first line really is our upper respiratory tract, which is a nice filter. Then we have the mucociliary escalator, and then we have the macrophages um, all the way down in the lower respiratory tracts. Again, because our lungs prefer that warm, clean, and humidified air. Um, now, if macrophages become overtaxed, they can cause damage to lung tissue. We actually think this may be one of the mediators for how people with uh, COPD uh, develop um, the scarring and damage to the lung. It's this repeated exposure to particulates. The macrophages are overactive. Um, there's more proteolytic enzymes that may be released if they potentially rupture. So um, we covered a little bit of anatomy. I hope this was a bit of a review. In the next unit, we'll get into um, some more physiology, um, specifically with ventilation. Thank you.